We did um, the strategic relocation. He talks about it in his book as well. We sell both at InfoWarsStore.com. Of course, I produce the film. Of course, we sell it. Uh, but, you know, he, he got into how they're going to do that more and more as a tool of control. But I first want to get into North Korea and the rest of that with Joel Skousen coming up in the next segment and, and how he thinks we can turn things around in this country. They fled from tyranny. Your oppressions planted them in America. And yet, actuated by principles of true English liberty, they met all hardships with pleasure compared with those they suffered in their own country from the hands of those that should have been their friends. Men whose behavior on many occasions has caused the blood of those sons of liberty to recoil within them. I know not what course others meet, but as for me, give me liberty, liberty. or give me death. Believe me, remember, I this day told you so. That same spirit of freedom which actuated that people at first will accompany them still. But a people jealous of their liberties liberty. and who will vindicate them if ever they should be violated. Sons of liberty. Sons of liberty. Sons of liberty. liberty. Is life so dear or peace so sweet as to be purchased at the price of chains and slavery? Forbid it, almighty God. Who controls the past, controls the future. Who controls the present, controls the past. The death of bin Laden marks the most significant achievement to date in our nation's effort to defeat Al-Qaeda. All you gotta do is start looking around, start thinking for yourself, start investigating things, and you will see it all right there. So you have the power. Humanity has the power. We have the power. Do you want to fight? You better believe you got one. Let us never tolerate outrageous conspiracy theories. As for me, give me liberty or give me death. The answer to 1984 is 1776. It's Friday, March 15th. I'm Paul Joseph Watson. This is InfoWars Nightly News, coming up on the show. Tonight, as an army colonel warns of the rise of the machines, we look at the kind of machines DARPA wants to create. Then, using the power of storytelling in the InfoWars, a short film premiere. And Obama talks tough ahead of his Israel visit. Biden says he's not bluffing. All this and more on tonight's InfoWars Nightly News. Top story tonight. New drone could snatch humans off the street. This is out of InfoWars.com. A new flying drone developed by researchers at the University of Pennsylvania could one day be used to snatch humans off the street. Justin Thomas and his colleagues at the GRASP lab have produced an avian-inspired claw drone that mimics the way an eagle uses its talons to grab a fish out of the ocean. And we've got a video of this thing in action, which you can see now. And obviously, when we talk about this being used to snatch people off the street, we're talking about a much larger model based on the same technology. But it's not Infowars.com making that connection about such a device snatching humans off the street. Obviously, this one's too small to do so. That's how a lot of the tech blogs responded to this story. Technology journalist Adario Strange envisages a future scenario where a larger version of the Eagle Claw drone could be used by law enforcement or military to pluck humans off the ground. This is what he said. The optimistic view of the, this development offers a vision of an emergency situation in which a drone could rapidly fly in and save a person from a perilous situation. But it's also fairly easy to imagine law enforcement and military using this development to grab human targets in coming years, writes Strange reporting for device.com. He adds, we may be about to see a return to the days when unseen hunters lurking in the sky could easily snatch a human off the street 
He's cut up because he's referring to the petrosaur, which is a flying reptile dinosaur that existed 65 million years ago. So this technology is a throwback to that. There's also simultaneous research, as documented in this article, taking place at Drexel University, which is centered around creating a flight stability software program for drones with arms that would enable UAVs to carry a weighty object without them falling out of the air. And the eventual purpose of that would be to, quote, interact with people or the environment. So it's all based around physically snatching people off the street, although that's still a long way off, according to the researcher involved in that project, Christopher Corpella. So they're developing drones that swoop down like a bald eagle does and snatch stationary objects off the street. And if you doubt that drone and robot technology is all being driven towards the purpose of apprehending and neutralizing suspects, whoever those suspects may be, and eventually killing them, then listen to this next story. Also out of Infowars.com, this is a story I wrote last night. U.S. Army colonel issues warning about remorseless killer robots. Award-winning military writer and former intelligence officer Colonel Douglas Pryor has penned an essay warning of the threat posed by remorseless killer robots that will be used to stalk and slaughter human targets in the near future. In an essay published by the United States Army Combined Arms Center, this, this is basically the U.S. Army telling you this, Pryor laments how the use of unmanned drones, which, of course, as we know, kill 50 innocent people for every suspected terrorist they slaughter. He writes about how they're perpetuating the wars, endangering America's global reputation. He then makes the warning that this is all leading towards the kind of nightmare dictatorial technocracy depicted in the Terminator movies, the rise of the machines. Quote, it seems heartbreakingly obvious that future generations will someday look back upon the last decade as the start of the rise of the machines, writes Pryor, adding that the U.S. government is developing robots so advanced they make today's predators and reapers look positively impotent and antique. These killer robots, though, will share one thing in common with their primitive progenitors. With remorseless purpose, they will stalk and kill any human deemed a legitimate target by their controllers and programmers. So Colonel Pryor is echoing the warning of other top experts in the field of robotics, Professor Noel Sharkey for one, who's also warned that these robots currently under development by DARPA, which of course is basically the Pentagon, will eventually be used to hunt down and kill, quote, enemy combatants, which of course under the loose and slippery definition of the terrorists now being banded about could be applied to just about anyone. Pay for a cup of coffee with cash, you know, buy food in bulk, according to the FBI. That makes you a potential terrorist. And it's a similar sentiment put out last year by Human Rights Watch. They said that if these robot armies currently under development are let loose on the battlefield, then war crimes will inevitably occur because the cyborgs have no emotional capacity. They're basically killing machines. And of course, if you've read the writings of futurists like Bill Joy and Ray Kurzweil, then the rise of the machines for humanity means we basically become a second-class species. Eventually, we become obsolete. And then, of course, you've got the Cambridge University study, which is looking into if robots with artificial intelligence pose, quote, extinction level risks for humanity. So that's where this is all heading, but it's a good sign that military insiders and robotic experts are, you know, vocally opposing the development of these robots in the direction which the likes of DARPA and the Pentagon clearly intend them to go, which is to be killing machines. Meanwhile, a company in Oregon is developing drone defense technology to sell to the public. This is out of US News and World Report. Do you want to keep drones out of your backyard? An Oregon company says it has developed and will soon start selling technology that disables unmanned aircraft. The company called Domestic Drone Countermeasures was founded in late February 
because some of its engineers see unmanned aerial vehicles, which are already being flown by law enforcement in some areas and could see wider commercial integration by 2015 as unwanted eyes in the sky. So this company has developed boxes which jam the surveillance capabilities of these drones, which are now being used by police departments across the country, of course, with massive Department of Homeland Security funding. And they say that within a relatively short period of time, they're going to be affordable for residential use. And of course, we've heard it said that the first person to shoot down a surveillance drone will be an American hero. This technology promises to neutralize the surveillance capabilities of those very same spy drones. But now the FAA is cracking down on photography drones being used by private citizens while simultaneously giving the green light to police departments and government agencies for them to use the unmanned aerial vehicles for surveillance purposes. So there's this clear attempt now as the technology becomes cheaper and more widely available to prevent the democratization of drone technology and only allow it to be in the hands of the authorities, just as they are now attempting to do with firearms, with the gun control push, only the police, only the authorities are allowed to own it. Whereas a lot of this drone technology is becoming more and more affordable, private citizens are getting involved, and the FAA is starting to crack down, but a new company there developing anti-surveillance drone technology, and early indications show it's gonna be very successful indeed. U.S. Air Force plans to build huge network of underground tunnels. This is an Infowars.com story. The U.S. Air Force is planning to build a huge network of underground subway tunnels in order to shuttle around nuclear missiles as part of an effort to move away from stationary silos that are easier to attack. The project will require a vast underground subway-like network of pathways to shuttle new missiles around to multiple launch portals, any of which could be used to fire the missile. Launch portals would be stationed at regular intervals along the subway, allowing the unmanned transponders to be raised up and the missile to be fired in a doomsday scenario. Each tunnel would be dedicated to one single missile and launch system. So if you thought the threat of nuclear war ended with the Cold War, then think again. Because over the next five years, US defense missile systems supposedly aimed at countering the threat posed by Iran, will be fully operational in both Poland and Romania by 2018. And as virtually every geopolitical analyst will tell you, that system is firmly aimed at Russia. And indeed, Vladimir Kozin, a leading researcher with the Kremlin-affiliated Russian Institute of Strategic Studies, recently asked why, quote, the US Air Force completed building new underground warehouses at 13 air bases in six NATO member countries to store precision nuclear air bombs. The only purpose of the US missile defense equipment deployed in Europe is to destroy Russian intercontinental ballistic missiles, he added. So you've got the bear bombers continually flying near American airspace. That happened again. A couple of weeks ago, they were intercepted over the island of Guam, the US-controlled island of Guam. And you've got Russia continually complaining about the fact that America, while on the surface saying they're reducing nuclear arms, are in fact behind the scenes upgrading the technology, as we can see with this vast underground network project. So while we're certainly not in a, a you know as perilous a situation as we were back in the 80s when I was growing up, the threat of a nuclear confrontation between the United States and Russia is not to be scoffed at, as another report, which is actually in this article, alludes to from the Strategic Studies Quarterly Journal of the US Air Force Air University. They talk about the threat of nuclear warfare between the US and Russia has never been higher since the end of the Cold War. So that's another interesting essay that you can read on that subject. People are willing to torture others if ordered to do so by authority figures, reports Mike Bundren out of naturalnews.com. New scientific evidence of the golden rule goes far beyond the usual assumptions and suggests that if you treat others with disdain, you not only suffer, but activate the same neurology as physical pain. Richard Ryan, 
co-author of, of the new University of Rochester study says, quote, this study shows that when people bend to pressure to ex exclude others, they also pay a steep personal cost. Their distress is different from the person excluded, but no less intense. So what's the golden rule? Well, it's basically treat others as you wish to be treated. And the headline refers to the Milgram experiment, which took place in the 70s, where it was discovered that people who were ordered to inflict torture on others in the form of electric shocks, to the point of simulated death, they were told that this voltage is going to kill them. 65% of people involved in the study did so. They went into this experiment expecting around 3% to comply with the order to deliver torture in the form of an electric shock that would kill somebody. Turns out it was 65% went ahead and did it, if, of course, ordered to do so by an authority figure under controlled circumstances. So what's the point of the article? Talking about the golden rule, treating others as you wish to be treated. Well, it refers to the work of another psychiatrist called Edmund Burglar, who in his studies proved that people actually take unconscious pain in inflicting trauma, whether it be physical or, or, or emotional, on other people, which brings the Milgram experiment into context. It's called psychic masochism, and that's why it trumps the golden rule of treat others as you wish to be treated, because it's a selfish means of deriving pleasure, masochistic satisfaction, as it were. And I think when I was reading this article, it really struck home that this goes right to the heart of why in today's society, where you know culture continually titillates our selfish tendencies, uh, tries to make us be amoral, not caring about other people, selfish. It goes to the heart of why people's personal relationships are permanently dysfunctional, why people don't seem to treat each other with respect, why people can walk past a little toddler that's just been hit by a car that's lying there on the side of the road dying. There's this disconnect from human emotion. And of course, if you extrapolate out to the political level, you can get an insight into the motivation behind the evil that people in positions of power continually perpetrate. So perhaps a better way of trying to enforce this golden rule, treat others as you wish to be treated, is this idea of treating others as if they were you, but living another life. And the studies prove that if you're actually nice to people, if you try to be nice to people, you'll personally be happier and more emotionally stable. And that's what this latest scientific research detailed in this article points to. So it's basically a win-win. It's about reinforcing the golden rule, treat others as you wish to be treated. Now, health news is this toxic chemical hiding in your toothpaste, reports Dr. Mark Burhen out of naturalsociety.com. And no, it's, it's not the obvious culprit that you're thinking of. It's not sodium fluoride. We're talking about sodium laurel sulfate. Quote, say that again and I'll wash your mouth out with soap. Did you ever get this threat from your parents as a kid if you used foul language? The irony is you're likely already washing your mouth out with soap on a twice daily basis. How is that possible? A compound called SLS or sodium laurel sulfate lurks not just in your toothpaste, but almost all products coming into contact with your skin, scalp and eyes, including makeup, hairsprays, lipstick, sunscreen, toothpaste, laundry, detergent, conditioner, perfumes and shampoo. Sodium laurel sulfate is everywhere and it's not doing good things for our health. Basically what it is, the froth in toothpaste, the thing that makes it frothy is sodium laurel sulfate. The true secret about brushing your teeth is you, basically you can use anything and it's not going to seriously damage your teeth. Back 150 years ago, they used coal to brush their teeth. There's a lot of people now, there's a whole movement of people who don't use any toothpaste whatsoever. But this article links to a Japanese peer-reviewed study which found that rats who were administered sodium laurel sulfate were more likely to develop colon cancer than a separate control group of rats uh, that were just administered a different substance. 
So there's a clear link to cancer, not to mention sodium fluoride, of course. This stuff is carcinogenous, basically. And the problem is that it's in even a lot of organic fluoride-free toothpaste. There was a toothpaste called Euthamol that I was using for years. Of course, it was fluoride-free, but it had sodium lauryl sulfate in it. So you were trading off one thing for another. So you really need to check for this SLS. It's called sodium lauryl sulfate. And if it's in there, switch brands. I use this brand, which is Aloe Dent. You can probably get something similar in America. And actually, Tom of Maine, Tom's of Maine does a toothpaste that doesn't contain sodium lauryl sulfate. But be careful because although they do non-fluoridated toothpaste, they also sell fluoridated toxic waste toothpaste. So if you're getting the Tom's of Maine, be sure to get the non-fluoride version, which also does not contain sodium lauryl sulfate. Or you could just buy Colgate or Crest or whatever if you want to reduce your IQ, uh, IQ and get cancer, which, of course, uh, a lot of people seem to want to do these days. They want to remain stupid and ignorant. But if you follow the advice in this article, not only do you get rid of the sodium fluoride, you also get rid of sodium laurel sulfate. Global news, Kurt Nimmo, Infowars.com reports, Obama signals Iran attack ahead of Israel visit. Disregarding early statements made by U.S. and Israeli intelligence, Obama told Israeli Channel 2 that it will take Iran a year to develop a nuclear weapon. Right now, we think it would take over a year or so for Iran to actually develop a nuclear weapon, but obviously we don't want to cut it too close, Obama said. The International Atomic Energy Agency, the Pentagon, leaders in the Israeli military and intelligence agencies in the United States and Israel have all concluded that Iran does not have a nuclear weapons program and is not building a nuclear weapon and has yet to decide if it will build one. And the link is in that article. It's all sourced and documented. But Obama's set to visit Israel next week to meet with Bibi, Benjamin Netanyahu, to build momentum for this attack on Iran. Of course, we hear this every year since probably about 2005, uh, that the the attack on Iran is scheduled for later that year. But they never seem to get their ducks in a row. Although this year we are hearing a lot of talk out of Bilderberg members and other elitists who have signaled that such an attack is on the agenda for the coming months. But what's absurdly ironic, which I wrote about a few days ago with Obama visiting Israel, is that Israel have actually been forced to install a brand new Iron Dome missile defense system at Ben Gurion Airport to protect Air Force One as it lands with Obama, to protect it from the very same terrorists on the Syrian border that Obama is funding in the effort to topple Bashar al-Assad. So they've had to install this expensive missile defense system to, to defend against the very same terrorists to which Obama is handing hundreds of millions of dollars in Americans' taxpayer money. Of course, the very same insurgents are also being trained, according to Der Spiegel, by U.S. special forces in Jordan. So they're, they're protecting Obama against the same terrorists in Syria that he's currently supporting as he visits to build momentum for an, an, an attack on Iran. And of course, some of these same al-Qaeda groups MEK Prime amongst them, have been used in the past couple of years by the Israelis and the US to carry out bombings and assassinations in Iran in an effort to destabilize their government. So again, using terrorists to achieve regime change while telling Americans that they need to be treated like slaves, surveilled, harassed, in the name of protecting the nation from the very same terrorists. That's going to do it for the news, but stick around after the break. David Knight sits down to talk to a couple of independent filmmakers who created an exciting new movie about liberty, and we're going to premiere their film on InfoWars. You're watching InfoWars Nightly News. Stay tuned. 
I'm Darren McBreen, and these are some of the new items that are available now at InfoWarsShop.com. Alert the public to Obama's blatant abuse of power with the new Obama t-shirt. Obama's joker face on the front and come and take it on the back. It's time to publicly call him out for what he is, a tyrant. Defend the Second Amendment with our top seller come and take it t-shirts. And look at that, women's cut tank tops and t-shirts now available. Nice hat. Plus, the Don't Tread on Me flag. And now you can become a micro distributor of the InfoWars magazine. Plus, get your own copy delivered right to your door each and every month. And if you're tired like I am of you and your family being exposed to polluted drinking water, get the Pro One High Performance Water Filter. It gets rid of all pathogenic bacteria, cysts, fluoride, heavy metals, and numerous other contaminants. So join the revolution at InfoWarsShop.com. InfoWars Magazine is more than just our answer to the internet kill switch. We're also going back to the roots of this country. When our founders, for a decade before 1776, known as the pamphleteers, with hundreds of little printing presses in every colony, got out the real news, the real information, and countered the system. This is tailored, designed with the truth to wake up your friends and family. This is the 21st century version of the pamphleteers. So get them at InfoWarsShop.com or InfoWarsStore.com. Sign up and buy them in bulk. Sign up and be a micro distributor uh, for a full year to buy them in bulk and get one of the newsstands added, or sign up and get 12 issues delivered to your door or give a gift subscription. Whatever you do, be part of the fight. And I want to salute and thank all of you that are subscribers and are getting the magazine in bulk or who have ever come to InfoWarsStore.com and bought any of our products because we are supported by patriots and liberty lovers like you. We couldn't do it without you. Well, Francis Ford Coppola had an interesting quote. He said, suspend your self-doubt, do only work you love, and make it personal. Well, that could apply to any business that you're in or any uh, aspect of life, but it especially applies to filmmakers. And we've got a couple of filmmakers here who did just exactly that. Um, they suspended their self-doubt and produced a uh, dramatic film as their first-time effort. Uh, they did it about something that they are passionate about, which is uh, an issue, euthanasia. And they uh, made it very personal because they did it as a fictional writing and, and they made it a very personal story, something that people can identify with. That's the power of doing fictional film. Welcome. We've got uh, Karen and Michael Iacobo, is that correct? Yes. Okay, great. And uh, this is your first film. I thought it was very good. We're actually going to preview it uh, right after the interview. We're going to let you tell us a little bit about the film. But I want to talk to you a little bit about uh, why you chose to do a fictional film your first time out. That's quite a, quite a lot to bite off. The reason, reason we chose to do a film was uh, I started out, I am a writer, and Michael also. And I had written some screenplays, sci-fi, Twilight Zone type stuff. And... And I'm starting out a little bit older. I'm not 20 years old. And instead of uh, sending screenplays out to Hollywood and doing the usual route, I decided I was going to hire a local filmmaker and make one of my shorter screenplays, hire a filmmaker, and um, have a DVD to go with a screenplay so I can show some kind of accomplishment. Mm -hmm. So I ended up talking with filmmakers, and that they encouraged me to make my own. And uh, Michael and I, being a little bit older, were smart enough to bring experts into this, people who had experience. So we hired a film production crew. And uh, that really helped us a lot. And we had an assistant director. We hired a professional photographer. And we uh, ended up making the film. And we decided, hey, wait a minute. We like this so much that we, we became filmmakers, essentially what happened. Okay, that's great. Yeah, when, when you did it, like I said, it's a, a very short film. It's only about 20 minutes long. But I thought the production values were very good. That, that makes sense. I thought you were doing everything from the first time out. But that's, that's super that you were smart enough to do that. You know, when we look at the info war, we, we've got a lot of different aspects. So, you know, what we're doing here, if you take a war analogy, we're, we're looking at uh, the news and, uh, and that's really kind of like an intelligence gathering. That's something that you've got to have. And, and, uh, but when we do a documentary, uh, the way we do it here at InfoWars, we're typically filling in the details that people can't get on a daily basis, kind of pulling the story together, giving the reference to the documents and everything. But 
what you're doing here is taking it to the next level, and that is really going for people's hearts. Uh, if you're a good storyteller, and that's the talents that you really bring to this, uh, story has a lot of power. It, it's the way Jesus communicated. It's the way uh, people, time before, and really before the printed uh, word got out, that's the way people had their most effective communication. And, uh, and, and that's what's so powerful about uh, fictional stuff. I really love what you, what you did with this. Thank you so very much. Thanks. Very, very kind. And, and one of the things we want to show, now this is not an entry, I should say, into Operation Paul Revere, uh, because this is something that was uh, done earlier. Uh, you're working on another project right now that you may have done in time. But uh, this is a good example for people out there who want to get into the film contest. This is a good example of uh, something that hits all the, the points that we're looking for. Um, it even has uh, something that people have been talking about a lot, and that's, uh, you know, we said, uh, had a lot of questions about, we asked people to do liberty placement, you know, have InfoWars in it. You work that in in a very subtle way. Tell us about that. Well, our story has some protesters, uh, protesting groups actually on two sides of an issue. And we had those on the uh, right side of the issue basically carrying a sign that said, Infowars.com, the truth. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You also had somebody, I think, wearing a t shirt, that sort of thing. So it was very yeah. subtle. It wasn't a big commercial, it wasn't in your face, but it was something that was there. And that's essentially what Alex is talking about. Uh, but it was something. And I guess one of the reasons why we're, we, we've got you here and we wanted to show this, it was something that was totally original piece of work, uh, something that was spot on uh, about an issue, a really fresh take on it. And uh, you mentioned uh, Twilight Zone. I mean, it, it does have that little bit of a plot twist to it. It yeah, was great. In fact, it's, it's the, uh, length, the length. It's the length of the original um, series, 22 minutes. When you subtract out the commercials, the original Twilight Zone was about 22 minutes. So it's our way of, um, you know, paying respect to the TV series mm -hmm. to make it exactly 22 minutes, mm -hmm. which was not too easy, but we did it. Yeah, it's a uh, yeah. There's a lot of things that are important about this, and, and you know, for people who are looking to. Uh, to help win the info war, people who uh, want to do things to turn hearts and minds, people who want to make money, make a living out of this and follow their passion. You know, it, it's what you did with a fictional uh, account is, is very good, very compelling. But you know, even if people are doing a documentary, they need to think about that as if it's a story. And you know, one of the best examples of that, I think, are, are films by Errol Morris. Uh, the first one that he did that got people's attention was A Thin Blue Line. And basically, uh, it, was a, it, it got a guy off a of death row uh, here in Texas. Um, mm -hmm. And he finished up, got an Academy Award with A Fog of War. That was an interview that he had for a long time with uh, Robert McNamara. But in each of his cases, uh, he's interviewing him, and, uh, and this, this, uh, the Thin Blue Line essentially was an investigation, and it was an unfolding story. And so although it was a, uh, a documentary, he actually filmed scenes uh, for the movie uh, that were kind of fictional reenactments of different witnesses uh, recalling what they had seen and that sort of thing. So it was very interesting uh, the way that he did it. And in each case, it kind of unfolded as a mystery. This guy had originally, before he had been uh, a filmmaker, he had been a private investigator. So everybody brings their different skills. You know, you were writers before you came into this. Uh, Alfred Hitchcock was an engineer. You know, people don't necessarily start out in film school who do a good job at, at film. This was our film school, that's for sure, making a film. <laughs> yeah. Yes, it took up quite a bit of our lives for about, uh, say, seven or eight months. Um, everything, pre-production, the actual filming, which took four or five days. Then you have post-production, where you have the editing, the music, and on and on. Mm -hmm. So it was very, very time-consuming, but it was worth it. Yeah, that's true. Now, you subcontracted this out to various professionals, and that's a great way to do it. Uh, for people who want to learn one aspect of it, one of the things that has really changed that people need to be aware of, they're making documentaries or films or even their own music video, 
is within the last 10 years, the price of production has really come down. It used to be that every piece of equipment was uh, six figures. You know, you want to get in it, into editing or, or colorization, each of those particular pieces of equipment were incredibly expensive, over $100,000. Now, in the last 10 years, it's all come down. The real cost is the cost of learning how to use it, you know, learning how to use that software. And the even greater cost is understanding you know, how, you know, bringing what you're bringing to it, the storytelling capability, you know, investing the time and seeing how to tell a good story, uh, how to do a good edit, how to compose your shots. Because even within the last five years, the last component that came into this was the camera. And in the last five years with uh, HD DSLRs, it's gotten to the point where if you invest some money in some really good lenses, the camera body doesn't really cost that much. And those lenses are going to carry forward with you. So yeah, I just want to offer a word of encouragement to other people that are out there that, uh, you know, this is a, a very important thing in the info war. It's a very important thing to, to uh, be able to communicate to people in different ways, whether it's a, a documentary, a documentary story, or whether it's a full-out fictional story. And I uh, really encourage people that that's that's what you found. Oh, absolutely, and that makes all the difference. You mm -hmm. have to know what you're doing, or bring in people with you that know what they're doing, and you have to be able to work with people of all kinds. Uh, everything from volunteer. We had interns from a film school that helped us greatly. We had we had actors of varying levels of uh, experience, and uh, we worked with, like we mentioned, professional photographer. And everybody has their own way of working because they are. All uh, knowing what they're doing. Right. And that and that's the key. Knowing what your strengths are and knowing what you can't do. Hiring out what you can't do. You know, you came in with a really strong writing background. Uh, somebody else might want to collaborate if they've got uh, t other technical capabilities, whether it's editing or filming or something like that. They might get with somebody, uh, collaborate with somebody or hire someone. So that's a key thing. Knowing where you need the help getting professional help in those areas, but you're going to be bringing something to the table in terms of your talent. That, that's true of any kind of business. In any kind of business, you gotta, you're bringing something in, but you've got to hire somebody to fill in the gaps of your experience. Yes, yeah, so and what's, what's happened from this is we've developed our own company, and we're planning on making a feature film, and we're planning on going on with this. We, we want to make films like sci-fi movies uh, that have been made in the past that have a very strong underlying message to them of, about human life and human worth and uh, other types of films that we, we really are making films for the InfoWars type audience mm -hmm. that will understand films on a deeper level. And that's the, that's the last thing I want to cover too, and that is the audience. That's what we're trying to do. We, we've got a large audience with InfoWars. We've got people who care about this issue. And if people haven't noticed by now, Hollywood is not going to make the films that we want to see. They're not going to make that's the right. films about the issues that are important to us and covered in the way that we want to see it. We have to do that ourselves. We have to learn how to do it that ourselves. And there's money to be made there. People can make a living doing this. InfoWars is an important marketplace to reach these people. Uh, we've talked about this being an online virtual film festival. You know, if you're a filmmaker, an independent filmmaker, you want to try to get in the uh, uh, movie theaters. The way you're going to do that, you're going to go to the Con Film Festival, you're going to go to Sundance, things like that. But uh, that's not going to really happen to most independent filmmakers. So uh, we've got something that's an online film festival where you're going to get a much, much larger audience than is typically going to be that you're going to reach at a film festival. And it's an audience that's sympathetic to your take on the issue. And, uh, and I think beyond that, uh, InfoWars is, is uh, we've already uh, helped people, a lot of people, uh, sell and market their own uh, products, their own uh, movies and uh, documentaries and that sort of thing. I see InfoWars developing as kind of a marketplace like uh, iTunes is for applications. Uh, you know, it's a, it's a great place to reach your target audience. And so we're trying to uh, bring all these different elements. You know, it's, you've got to have an audience. You've got to have producers. We're trying to kickstart this project. That's the whole point of the Operation Paul Revere contest. Absolutely, and from listening to InfoWars Alex Jones show over the years, I find that the audience is the most intelligent people I've ever heard, and the most humane. People are really concerned about their fellow man, they're concerned about their country, they're concerned about the future of this world, and we're seeking out people like this. We want to work with people like this in making films. We're looking for them. That's great. Well, we're going to take a quick break, and we're going to come right back after the break and uh, let you introduce your film, and we're going to preview your film here on InfoWars. Everybody stay tuned. We'll be right back with that. If you are receiving this transmission, you are the resistance. Fellow freedom lovers. 
Alex Jones here with the biggest contest announcement we've ever made. This is so incredibly exciting. We are launching Operation Paul Revere. What did Paul Revere do? He rode through the countryside in New England saying to arms, to arms, the Redcoats are coming. One is by land, two is by sea. And all that evil men and tyrants need to flourish is that good men and women do nothing. Let me officially announce Operation Paul Revere, a $100,000 cash first place winner to be judged by yours truly, Alex Jones. The film can be three minutes, it can be up to two hours. It can be fiction, nonfiction, documentary, drama. It's got to promote liberty and freedom and expose tyranny and oppression. And it's not just people in the US that can enter, it's folks worldwide. The rules, the details are at infowars.com forward slash contest. You have to read the rules and officially sign up for this because it's a $100,000 prize first place, $10,000 second place, $5,000 third place. But just as I did last year with a reporter contest, we are going to crowdsource from the pool of incredible talent out there and hire several official crews to be directors and writers and camera people in Infowars.com produced major films and documentaries that will be put in movie theaters and on cable. And I've got all the connections to get it done. Together, we're gonna really give the New World Order hell. This is extremely exciting. I've made over 20 films. One of them alone has reached more than 40 million people on YouTube and Google Video. The Obama Deception, Endgame, Fall of the Republic, Road to Tyranny. Films are the most effective thing I do, but they're very time consuming. And so I want to turn the power of We the People loose here. And your art, your research, your ideas are unstoppable. We're officially kicking the contest off this Friday. And you've got a little more than three months until April 30th. Just a little more than three months to produce your documentary or your film and get it out. And it will absolutely reach tens of millions of people. Our normal contest get about 500 entries. That's what $10,000 prizes. This is 10 times that, 100,000 for first place. That's one of the biggest contests out there. In fact, it's the biggest next to Doritos that has $100,000. This is huge, ladies and gentlemen, $115,000 in cash prizes and a shot to have your film produced and financed by Infowars.com. Edit it, upload it to YouTube and one other alternate public video site and send your entry to Paul Revere at Infowars.com. The animating contest of liberty that Thomas Jefferson talked about is happening right now. The modern battlefield is in the mind more than ever. We use truth. The globalists use lies and deception. The corruption and oppression and high-tech police state is in our face. But the controllers are scared. They intended to use the internet to dominate and control humanity and surveil us. But we've turned their system against them. This is a historic crossroads that we have reached. And I ask you to ride in the year 2013, just as one of the founders of this republic did back in 1775. I'm calling you to arms in the info war because the pen and the video camera is mightier than the sword. Let's go in there and rescue humanity and awaken them and set brush fires in the minds of men and women everywhere. Be part of this contest. You've got three months. Put your hat in the ring. Be part of the solution to the corruption and oppression. Be part of the resistance to tyranny. We're looking for the Paul Revere's that will drive a stake through the New World Order's wicked heart. Well, welcome back. We've got a couple of filmmakers that uh, we're talking to that just did a short film, and it's called The Unproductive. And we're going to let them introduce the topic to you real briefly, and then we're going to actually preview the film. So stick around. I think you'll really like it. Now, the title, The Unproductive, I think really came from this quote that they had in their press release. It's from um, a uh, bishop uh, at the time of uh, Hitler, and he was writing in Germany as Hitler was coming to power, and he said, if the principle that man is entitled to kill his unproductive fellow man is established and applied, then woe betide all of us when we become aged and infirmed. If it's, if it's legitimate to kill unproductive members of the community, woe betide the disabled. And then he continues to uh, expand that out to even uh, disabled soldiers who return. And uh, that's essentially the theme of this, uh, this film that they're doing, this short film. 
Uh, Karen and Michael, could you uh, tell us a little bit about that? What uh, got you interested in uh, the issue of euthanasia briefly? What got me interested in the issue was the 2005 saga of Terry Schindler Schiavo. I was watching that like everybody else, and um, it was talked about that the woman was brain dead or, or like she was terminally ill. Yet I saw her on that video where her eyes followed the balloon, and I thought to myself, my goodness, this person looks alert. Her eyes are following the balloon. And I started, I was listening to InfoWars, and InfoWars gave an entirely different perspective on the whole thing, that she was not brain dead mm -hmm. and she was not terminally ill. And so I started thinking about this with a journalistic background like Michael also has. And I said, it's the way the issue is being framed. And I saw people around me, including good Catholics who, you know, do not believe in killing people who are not brain dead, for example. And um, I saw them reacting because they had let go of loved ones, and which is a very sad situation that actually were terminally ill. And their pain was being reawakened by this. And I, I would say to them, well, that's not what's happening. And other people would say, no, no, this lady is actually not brain dead. So I, I got thinking about it, and I, this is where the story evolved from, the unproductive. And actually, it wasn't until we were shooting the film that I stumbled upon that quote from Bishop Galen, because I looked up the unproductive one day to see if anybody was using uh, the title, and there came Bishop Galen out of the past. I'd never even heard of the gentleman before. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, that was just a horrific uh, situation. I, I just could not believe believe what I was seeing as it unfolded, seeing people uh, get arrested for trying to give her water. I mean, you know, what kind of a country are we creating here? And why wouldn't a governor or a president, you know, Governor Bush or President Bush, I, I totally lost uh, any any modicum of respect uh, for the Bushes that could have possibly been there when I saw that. I mean, there was plenty to, to be worried about about the Bushes before that. But, I mean, I just could not understand how the Christian community in general, you know, Catholic, evangelical, whatever, I, I just could not understand how they could see someone who would not give a person a cup of cold water as a Christian. I mean, it just it just amazed me. But you really hit the nail on the head with this picture. And I really appreciate you doing this. We're very proud to... Uh, to preview this, and we're going to go to that right now. Thank you so much for your work on this, and we look forward to seeing what you produce next. Our thank pleasure, you, and thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Bye bye. bye. Well, we're going to have that for you right after uh, uh, just a couple of minutes. I uh, just wanted to tell you about Prison Planet TV. Uh, Karen and Michael said that they've been uh, Prison Planet TV subscribers for quite a time. Uh, you can see all of Alex's documentaries there. It's a way to help support our operation. Uh, any operation needs money to run. It helps to pay for our bandwidth. And speaking of bandwidth, you can have up to 10 people at a time can uh, view this. Uh, you can hand that out to other friends and family. Uh, help to wake them up. Well, that's it for tonight's news. We're going to go now to the movie, and we'll be back tomorrow night at 7 Central, 8 p.m. Eastern.
presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup will flow. Surely goodness and love all the days of my life. He's a vegetable. That's all there is to it. He told his wife that he'd never want to be kept alive as a vegetable. He deserves to have his wish respected. The controversy here shows no signs of letting up. The tension here is high as both sides await word of the impending death of the patient. Live from Connie General Hospital, for TV5, I'm Belinda Marciano. Back to you, Rick. Well, I can tell the weather pretty good. <laughs> How'd you become involved with all this? Someone's got to do something. You're just in time. We could really use your help. Vegetable? What a word to describe somebody. You know he isn't brain dead. Wendy, have you even looked at what's really going on here? I have, Alan. And I'm sorry if you just don't get it. Postmodernism, moral relativism, situational ethics. Known by many terms, this ancient idea that there is no absolute right or wrong has been resurrected right in our own time. It's quite trendy, even scholarly, to proclaim that no action is wrong. It's only different. Different culture, different way, different belief. Two cousins on the opposite ends of a controversy, each doing what they believe is the right thing to do. Sometimes, life actually pays close attention to our beliefs. Did you see the video? He tries to speak. That's not a vegetable. It's a grunt, a physical reaction, a knee jerk. What do you want? It's more than that. Besides his parents, want him to live. That should be enough. The courts ruled against keeping him alive. Are you... Are you smarter than the judges, Alan? I never said that. Or what about the doctors? You know more than them too, right? No. If you just watched the interview with the man's parents and brother and sister, it's obvious they are too attached to him and don't want to face reality. Let him die in dignity. You always did. I thought... I thought that you, with all your causes, that you'd want to help me with this. I guess not. Well, I... I gotta get the coffee out there. Everyone's getting cold. But you're not getting the whole story. Doctors who have a different opinion are not being put on TV. And T 
TV reporters don't care about him or his family. TV's all theater, Wendy. Theater. Would you want to be kept alive if you were in his position? I wouldn't. I wouldn't want to, to be a burden on anyone. Dehydrating and starving a person to death is what the Nazis did. Look at this. Facts, cause not fantasy. See? This is from a conspiracy website. Anyone who isn't brain dead knows that. Conspiracy? Is that your word for the truth? <laughs> you know, truth that you can bear to hear. That man in there has a functioning brain. That's another extreme opinion. Do you actually think that I wouldn't know if he wasn't a vegetable? My mother was like that man is now. I remember what happened to Auntie. She was terminal. I had to take my mother off the machine. Wendy. Wendy, I'm so sorry. What happened to your mom? It's not the same as this. You don't know what that was like. You never had to go through what I went through. You went through a lot. But what's happening to the men in there has nothing to do with your mother. The church has even come out in support of him so he can live. Doesn't that mean anything? I am a good Catholic and you know it. And when, by the way, was the last time that you were in a church? This isn't about me. He is aware of what's going on. He has a brain injury. That's all. He's disabled. He's not brain dead. He could have therapy. He could regain full brain function. That's a possibility, you if know. If that was true... We're not children anymore. Believe in everything we're told. God. The control corporate media has... has an agenda. so clear that they never discuss the rights of the disabled. Having that does not make you an expert on the disabled. So why don't you just keep your paranoid delusions to yourself, okay? I have work to do here. In other news, the leader of the Let Him Die protest remains hospitalized several weeks after she was struck by a speeding vehicle. How well are you holding up, Alan? You do know why I'm here, don't you? Yes. Wendy has you listed as her closest remaining relative. No. I can't. She's coming back. Her mind is just resting right now. I I'm sure. The accident damaged her brain. She's been designated persistent vegetative. She's not coming back. This is the document she signed attesting to her desire not to be kept alive under artificial conditions. Alan, I'll need your signature too. 
What if I don't want to sign it? Take a moment. Think about what Wendy would want you to do. I don't need a moment. I told you people, but nobody seems to listen to me. Are you 100% sure that she isn't coming back? There are errors in these cases. Aren't there? No, not that I know of. Have you seen the counselors here on staff? I don't need your counselors. Her heart. Her heart's still beating. She's still a human being. She has a soul. My cousin's brain is not her soul. The only reason she is alive is because of this technology. Her brain is just injured. And, and this is why she can't live on her own. I mean, there, what if you did something different? Alan, There's got to be other options here. Alan, she's dead. She's brain dead. Her brain is gone. You're doing the right thing. It's what she wanted. Terminating a life can be, well, can be a blessing. And besides, you, you'll be giving this bed to someone who can live a productive life. in the shadow of the Almighty. Say to the Lord, my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I trust, for he'll rescue you from the snare of the fowler, from the destroyer's pestilence. I don't know if you can hear me. But I'm so sorry. I guess, I guess I was wrong. People shouldn't be kept alive this way. <laughs> you remember when... <laughs> you remember when we used to go camping? And at the end of the night, you know, we, we used to sit around at the at the campfire, and, and I used to sing. You know, I haven't told you in a long time, but I love you. And I hope you know. I hope you know that I did this for you.
I didn't expect to see you here today. How are you, Bernadette? Glad the media circus is over? <sighs> Prescribing myself a stiff drink and two weeks in the Caribbean. And kudos to you, Doctor. We've exceeded quota this quarter. The unproductive do have their use. As humanity moves full speed ahead towards Big Brother's brave new world, the 1776 revolutionary idea of unalienable rights has been blown off course. We are returning to the distant shores of ancient Rome and Babylon, where the difference between right and wrong is murky. Life is cheap, and organs can be so expensive. Sure. 